experiencing technical difficulty. Please stand by. While we're figuring this out, we'll go ahead and we will go ahead and read uh, James verse in chapter 2, starting in verse 14. And as is our custom here, if you would please rise in reverence to the reading of the word of the Lord. James chapter 2, starting in verse 14. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith, but does not have works. Can his faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothes and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and eat well, but you don't give them what the body needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith, if it doesn't have works, is dead by itself. But someone will say, you have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without works, and I will show you faith from my works. You believe that God is one. You do well. The demons also believe and shudder. <clears throat> Foolish man, are you willing to learn that faith without works is useless? Wasn't Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? You see that faith was acted together with his works, and by works faith was perfected. So the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him for righteousness, and he was called God's friend. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. In the same way also, wasn't Rahab the prostitute also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by a different route? For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. The word of the Lord. Let us pray. Gracious and merciful Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for how it is proclaimed. We thank you for how it's been carefully preserved throughout generations. And Father, we thank you for how you are about to reveal what you have for us this morning from your word. We thank you for this in the name of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. <laughs> So y'all may have noticed it's Halloween this week. Um, it's the week when kids everywhere get to pretend to be something they're not. You know, kids of all ages. I know plenty of adults that do that too. It's always fun to see all the superheroes, the princesses, the cowboys, the police officers, firefighters, all that. Um, of course, the adult versions of these costumes are not nearly so good. I, you know, we won't go into that, but I learned a while back, you do have to be careful around Halloween a little bit. Tammy and I were at a Halloween party. It was a kid's Halloween party being put on by a school, and we were there, and I, I saw a guy that I thought, wow, this guy's got a really good costume, and so I whispered over to my wife, hey, that fat guy in the Mohawks dressed like a police officer. Learned a couple things that day. I don't whisper very well. And he was an actual police officer. Yeah. <laughs> Have any of y'all ever seen the movie Catch Me If You Can? It's the real, it's sort of a real life con man named Frank Abagnale Jr. It's based uh, partially on his uh, autobiography. But this guy made a short career out of conning people out of their money by pretending to be something he wasn't. Most notably, uh, pretending to be an airline pilot. Uh, it was actually pretty easy for him, even though he was a teenager, because his hair was starting to gray. So he looked older than he was. 
And apparently it's, it was really easy back then to get a Pan Am pilot's uniform. He called the company, gave them a fake pilot number and said that his uniform had been lost at the hotel cleaners. So they sent him a new one. Well then he used that uniform to go and stay at hotels on Pan Am's dime, go eat on Pan Am's dime, and even fly from place to place you know, at, not as a pilot, but flying deadhead, you know, to go get from place to place. He did a lot of that. He was able to convince a whole lot of people that he was a pilot. But then we have to ask the question, well, what would have happened had he actually needed to fly the plane? There would have been a big problem. Similarly, it is very easy to claim to be a Christian. We don't even require a uniform, unless you're in certain backgrounds. If somebody came here off the street and claimed to be a Christian, we'd believe him, right? I mean, why not? Are people trying to be Christians to infiltrate us? It doesn't seem likely. So, would we find out, maybe when we asked him to land the plane for us, Today, we're looking to James to examine what a true disciple of Christ looks like and how that disciple might differ from those who just want to be called Christians. And a little bit about James, a little background here. James had left church again, and he could not believe the things that he had seen and heard. It's a rough time. You know, the pastor and the deacons, the way they treated the obviously wealthy guest, it was ludicrous. It was, you know, fawning all over and putting him in the good seat, all that. He talks about that. And then the way they treated the poor guest, making him sit on the floor. The way they treated each other was not any better. And the stupid things that they said that they attributed to Jesus. They thought that Jesus came so they wouldn't have to follow the law. Isn't that crazy? Jesus never said any such a thing. Why would they think that? He, Jesus himself said he had not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. And James had actually known Jesus. He was his younger brother. He hadn't believed him for a long time. You know, we know who Jesus is. You know, Jesus was the older brother that everybody seemed to like better. Any of y'all ever have an older sibling? He was smart. Everybody loved him. Mom and Dad had this incredible story about how he's born in a stable in Bethlehem at tax time. And then there was that time when he was 12 when he snuck off to the temple and missed the caravan coming home. I'm sure James thought, well, if I had done that, I wouldn't be able to sit down still. People followed Jesus, and he taught the most unbelievable things. So unbelievable, in fact, that his own brother James didn't believe him. He claimed to be the Messiah. That, his, James was warning him, you've got to stop this. This is going to get you killed. And it did. It got him crucified. With James still not believing. But then, the miraculous happened. Jesus came back from the dead. Now, seeing someone on a cross dead, and then three days later alive, is going to make a believer out of you, even if it is your older brother. So, Jesus even appeared once to James by himself. Jesus had proven himself to be the Messiah. He, was, he had proven everything he said to be true. Well, then where does that leave James? Well, kind of shocked, but kind of a new believer. He understood. He understood all the things that his brother had been preaching this whole time. So then why, less than 30 years later, would the church be acting so differently than what Jesus had taught? Why would they? And one of the problems... This guy named Paul. You've all, you all have heard of Paul, right? You know, talked about a lot in Acts, wrote a lot of the New Testament. 
Paul's a great guy, you know. He wasn't always a great guy. He started out as a really bad guy. He was a Pharisee. He was trying to kill all the Christians. He was on his way to Damascus to arrest and kill Christians. And then what happened? He encountered Jesus. You know, Jesus is already dead, crucified, you know, written, ascended by this point. Paul encounters him. So now, all of a sudden, Paul, who had not been a believer, was proclaiming that Jesus was the Messiah and that you must be saved by faith. And this is important because Paul's right. You must be saved by faith. It is by faith alone. But people were taking that and running with it. Okay, I've got to have faith, nothing else. People were running off with it. Well, James had to address that because while Paul was right that it is by faith alone, there has to be some evidence of that faith. You cannot claim to be changed by the gospel and live the same old way you did before. You just can't do it. <clears throat> These people at this church were thinking they could just say and believe, you know, say they believe. Everything's okay. People still say that today, don't they? Don't they realize what Jesus went through for them? So James had left the church. He had seen and heard enough. These people were not living up to the example that Jesus had given them because Jesus never mistreated the poor. He fed people, healed the sick, reached out to the sinners. Why would people in church think they didn't have to? And before we sit here and think, well, I don't know why people in church would think that. That goes on in church today, too. So James started writing this, God, this epistle that bears his name. He started writing. He wanted the whole church to know that simply claiming to have a saving faith does not make it so. Faith always requires action. Faith without works is like a body without a spirit. James wrote that, by the way. The misunderstanding of what Paul had been teaching had kind of reached an apex and it had to stop and James, that's what James was addressing. And he gives a couple examples like all good preachers do. He gives examples out of the scripture, out of the Old Testament because that's, you know, at the time, that was all the scripture. He gave examples, such as Abraham. We have all heard of Abraham, right? You know, God told him, you know, leave your homeland, your family, go to this land I will show you, and you're going to be a great nation. Well, then, Abraham never had any children for years and years and years. He gets to be like 100 years old. Finally, God gives him one son. Well, then... What does God tell him to do with that son? Take him up and sacrifice him. Now, I'm sure to Abraham this seems strange because God is not one to ask for human sacrifice. But he had known human sacrifice in other religions. and So he, in his faith, <coughs> acted on that faith by taking his son... His only son, the son that had been promised to him that would be a great nation, he took that son up the mountain, was ready to sacrifice him. Because he knew, even if he did sacrifice this son, that God could bring him back or something. He knew what God had promised. He wasn't ignorant to that. So he exercised his faith in obedience. Of course, you know, we know, we remember the story, you know, he was stopped just short of bringing down the knife and God had provided a ram stuck by its horns. Now, I am sure that Isaac's relationship with his father was not the same after that. But clearly, we see Abraham's faith. We also see the faith of Rahab the prostitute. It's very interesting that Rahab comes up mentioned so many times. Rahab was 
a lady of the evening in Jericho as the uh, Israelites are coming through. They're about to take over the land. You know, they're, they're in spying out the land. Some people know that they're there. They saw them go into Rahab's house. Rahab hid them. She understood to be true that God had given them that land, and she hit these guys and just asked that, that they would preserve her family. And they made that deal with her. And they got out. They preserved her family. And she is actually in the first chapter of Matthew listed in the genealogy of Jesus. Think about that. So she also exercised faith. So then how... Will people want know that we believe? How will people know that we are Christians if we don't exercise our faith in some way? If we don't live out our faith? If we don't show our faith by some works? How will people know that we're a Christian? Let's face it, we see all sorts of people claiming to be Christians. Oh, you know. And I feel sorry for the Catholic Church. You know, they've got so many politicians claiming to be Catholic that are holding positions that are entirely against the views that, they, that their church teaches. It's not just them, though. I saw this thing one time that said, if you were accused of being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Now, we, of course, accept the word of many who claim to be Christians without looking for any sort of evidence in their lives. Now, I want to be careful here because I don't want us to think that what James is doing here is telling us to go back and live according to the law. He's not doing that. What James is saying is that a true faith in Christ will cause you to do the things that the law requires. The law required that people take care of the poor, that they help the widows and the orphans, that they care for their neighbors. The law actually required that, but people would do some of that stuff out of legalism, not out of genuine love. The point is that as the result of our faith, we will just naturally do these things. It is not our works that will save us. If you do not believe, if you do not have faith, it doesn't matter how many of the law's works you do, you won't make it. However, if you do have faith, if your faith is genuine, it will cause you to do these things that are required. Now, after writing this letter, James continued to be faithful and obedient until he was martyred in A.D. 62. His faith made him obedient until the very end of his life. The question I have for you is, what is your faith going to cause you to do? Think about this. For a long time, the church in America has been full of people who dressed and spoke the part. It was, you know, show up in, in the suit on Sunday morning, say the right things. They came to eat at the table, if you will. But when the time actually came to ask them to get in the cockpit to do something, they abandoned the plane. When asked to feed their hungry neighbors, they said, that's what we have the government for. When asked to visit the sick, they said, that's what we pay the pastor for. When asked to tell their neighbor about the love of Christ, they're like, that's the preacher's job. 
Now, sure, they framed it in some nice churchy language, and some of you all know these things. You know, ask somebody to do something, they'll be like, I'm not called to do that. Or my favorite, I'll pray about that. Which is a nice way of saying, I'm putting you off for now so I can think of a better way to tell you no later. We know this. The reality is that our faith is not and never was intended to be a passive faith. It is intended to be an active faith. So then, what do your works say about your faith? Do you even have any works? Or, maybe the question is more appropriate, do you even have a faith at all? As we go into our decision time, I do want you to consider these questions, and I want you to see what the Lord is revealing to you today. Is he calling you to help with some feeding ministry? Is he calling you to some act of service? Or is he calling you to tell one of our 7,658 lost neighbors about him. Or, if you've not yet believed, is he calling you into a relationship with him? Now, I like to, I like to use what Dr. James Merritt calls bad news, worst news, good news, best news. I, and it goes like this. Really, the, bad, the gospel is bad news before it's good news. And the bad news is that we are all sinners separated from God. Everybody sins, and sin is the thing that separates us. God is holy. He cannot allow sin into his presence. And the worst news than that is that there's absolutely nothing that we can do to take care of our sin problem. You know, religion? Religion won't help you. You know, trying to do all the things, you know, I obey the Ten Commandments. <laughs> That's not going to get you there because you don't do it perfectly. Trying harder. Anybody ever tried harder in life? There is nothing we can do to take care of our sin problem, but the good news is that Jesus did for us what we cannot do for ourselves which is he lived that sinless life. He died on the cross for our sins, and his payment was proven at his resurrection, as James discovered. And the best news of all is that Jesus' forgiveness and eternal life is a free gift. All you have to do is receive it. You have to do three things. You now remember three things, right? You have to realize you're a sinner. You have to repent of your sin. And you have to receive Christ as your Lord and your Savior. It's that simple. And then if you're presenting this to somebody, you can ask them three questions that will wrap this all up. This is so good. Do you understand what you've heard and does it make sense to you? The second question is, is there any reason you can give God that God would accept why you could not receive Christ into your life? And then finally, you just ask them, are you willing to pray to Christ for your salvation? Now, what I'm going to do is give everybody here a chance to close your eyes, bow your head. And I know that, I know that most here have professed Christ as Savior before, but maybe you haven't. If you've not yet presented to pray to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, I'm going to give you a chance to do that, and it's really simple. You can... If you mean this in your heart, you can repeat this prayer after me, and we will go from there. Lord Jesus, I confess today that you are Lord. I turn my life over to you to do your will. I believe in my heart that you were born of a virgin lived a sinless life, 
died on a cross for my sins, were buried for three days, and that you were raised from the dead on the third day. I confess that I am a sinner and ask your forgiveness for my sins. I commit my life to you from this day forward. Amen. And here in the sanctuary, we are going to turn to our hymn of invitation, number 309, which is, Lord, I'm coming home. Uh, if you have prayed to receive Christ for the first time this morning, you may come forward during the invitation, or if you are more comfortable afterward. If you are joining us uh, online later, you can send a message to the church, and we will happily get with you and help you to start your new life in Christ.